Hey everyone, welcome to Professor Long's Lectures in Microbiology. I'm Professor Bob Long. Uh, as you know, these videos are intended for use by my students in my course, but if anyone else out there on YouTube land finds them helpful, by all means, use them. Please hit like and let me know if they're helpful. You can also let me know if they're not helpful. Um, I do know that these videos aren't up to my level of satisfaction usually because they're done in a very short period of time due to the changes we're experiencing in delivery um, due to COVID. So, I got a cell phone, I got a board, and I got me, and I'm trying to get this information out pretty quickly. So I apologize if they're not the most smooth and professional videos. I'm going to be working on updating them. I just need to get these out for students to use um, during an active semester, and in between semesters I'll go and reshoot everything. Finally, please know that these videos are intended to provide sort of a fundamental understanding of the basic principles in microbiology. By no means is this an extreme uh, survey or a very detailed uh, uh, covering of all the topics and all the details that we could go through. Um, we could spend years covering microbiology and we just don't have that time. We got 16 weeks. So um, I'm gonna provide some fundamental concepts and principles and then we want to build upon that and add details throughout the semester and throughout the rest of your career. So what we've been discussing is diseases and epidemiology and there's uh, three things that I wanted to discuss before we wrap this up, okay? Um, we've, we've gone over a bunch of definitions. We've gone over um, how, uh, how we can classify diseases or categorize them or describe diseases. Now, three things that I want to discuss today is what are some sources of transmission of disease? How are they transmitted? And then we want to talk about the um, five stages of the disease state. And then we'll wrap this up and move on to another chapter. So. Sources of transmission. Um, basically, um, how are diseases carried around and how can they be transmitted? Forgive me while I step off screen. I forgot to take out my markers. And so I need to get all my markers for writing on the board. How could I forget one of the most important things? My writing utensils. But anyway, um, so when we're talking about sources of transmission, we're talking about you know, how is a disease carried around? And so when we talk about a source of transmission, one of the things we have to know is the definition of what is a reservoir, which is sort of a French word, which means reserve. Like if you want to reserve something, you hold on to it for a while. So when we talk about a reservoir, what we're talking about is a place where the microbe lives between infections. So there are microbes that hang around in the universe and live inside of another organism and don't cause that organism to get infected or ill and then can be transmitted to humans. And so we call these reservoirs. Now there's actually human reservoirs. When we talk about human reservoirs, we can talk about several types. So for human reservoirs, one is a person who's ill. If you are ill from something, if you're carrying a disease, for example, someone who has flu or someone who has COVID-19 or um, someone who's uh, got, uh, you know, chicken pox, they might be contagious. And so they are a reservoir. The disease is living in them. And while it's causing an infection in them, it's also living in them and can cause other people to be infection infected. So we we would consider a person who is ill a human reservoir. And then there's another thing called a carrier. A person infected with a pathogen who does not display signs or symptoms of the disease caused by that pathogen. So some people can be infected and carry the disease, but not be ill from it. They don't display the pathology or they don't show the signs and symptoms of the disease. For example, a person can be infected with HIV, the human immunodeficiency virus, but not be showing signs and symptoms of AIDS. And sometimes they can walk around with the virus for years. 
we would say that that person is a carrier. Um, so, um, if a person is ill, or if they're not ill, they're considered a reservoir. And if the reservoir is a person who's not infected, or who's infected, but is not showing signs of the disease, they would simply be called a carrier, okay? Um, <clears throat> now, we can have animal vectors. If it's an animal vector, it's an animal. So, you know, raccoons, possums, a deer, um, we, uh, for example, Lyme disease. There's a, an organism called Borrelia, and Borrelia causes Lyme disease. The reservoir can be a deer. A deer can carry this disease around and not be infected, so they would be an animal reservoir. By the way, a vector is an organism, or we could say a thing, actually, it doesn't have to be alive, that can transmit the disease. If I could write today, I'm having this problem more and more. Or infect a human with it. Because we're talking about human diseases. I mean, there's, we're not talking about um, veterinary medicine, or we're not talking about plants and other things. So a vector is something that can transmit the disease or infect a human. So for example, in a Lyme disease, the reservoir is a deer. The vector would be an arthropod, it would be a tick. A tick can bite a deer. You go out hunting and you're, you know, find a deer carcass or you're cleaning the deer and some tick gets on you and bites you, you could pick up Lyme disease for that. The vector would be the arthropod, the tick. The reservoir would be the animal carrying it. You know, a few common animal vectors, for example, for like rabies, would be uh, possum, uh, raccoons, cats and dogs infected with it, bats. And so birds, deer, pigs, cows, anything that can, um, any animal that can serve as a reservoir would be an animal reservoir. That vector is something that can transmit the disease from the animal, okay, to a human. Um, and again, we can have different types of vectors. So vectors can be animal vectors, like ticks and um, mosquitoes and other arthropods, lice and things. Um, there are inanimate vectors, things like um, what we would call biological vectors, something that's alive, like uh, tick or lice or um, mosquitoes and things. But there are also uh, what we call uh, mechanical vectors or inanimate vectors. So you could pick up a disease from dirty dishes, from soil, from water, sometimes called environmental vectors when they're things like um, well, if you pick up a disease from the soil or from water or from um, you know bad air in a cave for example so those would be uh, environmental vectors um, also there's a whole other type of vector called a fomite fomite are inanimate objects that serve as vectors okay so if I'm talking about a fomite, let me see if you can see all of this on the edge of the board. I'm writing very, very, very close. Now you can read it all. Thank you. Um, so a fomite would be something like a cup or a fork or um, clothing, some bedding in a hospital or um, you know, a dirty glove or something. Those would be fomites, inanimate objects that can serve as vectors as well. So when we're talking about... Um, sources of transmission, we're talking about reservoirs. And there's human reservoirs, there's animal reservoirs, there are environmental reservoirs. And we just talked a little bit about this. This would be things like soil, water, air, dust, and a house, okay? If you're in an old dusty attic and you breathe in some dust, you might pick up some infectious agent from that. Those would be environmental 
vectors, or, I mean, I'm sorry, environmental reservoirs. They can hold on to this stuff for a while. Again, a vector is anything that can transmit the disease um, from a reservoir to a person. And when we talk about some things, we're talking about inanimate objects, we would call those fomites. Finally, one last thing I want to mention before I move on from this. Okay, I'm going to erase some of this because I need some room to write this down. I want to define the term zoonosis. And if you look at it, it has the term zoo in it. So when we talk about a zoonosis, really what we're talking about is a human disease um, that is caused by a pathogen that has an animal reservoir. So zoonosis is just a human disease that are um, caused by a pathogen that utilizes an animal reservoir. A lot, Lyme disease is an, ex, uh, an excellent example of a zoonosis, okay? Um, uh, also things like, you know, Rocky Mountain tick fever, um, and other uh, rickettsias that we get from ticks and arthro arthropod bites. Um, so, uh, yeah, we'll leave it at that, okay? Now, we've talked about sort of some sources of transmission, right? Reservoirs. Now, um, how we transmit them would be uh, sometimes, for example, uh, the, the, the method of transmission can be person to person. So if we have a contagious disease, that would involve direct human contact, like um, you know, kissing, sexual contact, sharing an IV uh, needle, things like that. That would be person to person contact or contagious uh, spread. And so we can have um, we can also have not, we can have a, a, a contagious disease that is not transmitted by direct human contact. So direct human contact is one way that that can be transmitted. There's also indirect human contact. For example, if someone has athlete's foot and they shower in a shower at the gym and then you go in and use that same shower, you could pick up the fungus that causes athlete's foot. So it's not direct human contact. You weren't rubbing feet with that person, although you could, you're playing footsies with someone who has athlete's foot. Um, but if you put on shoes from someone who had it, then you can get the fungus, and that would not be direct human-to-human -human contact. Okay? So those would be things like that would be considered communicable diseases. So contagious simply means that you can transmit it from person to person. Communicable means that people can spread it, but usually not through direct contact. Okay? Um, and by the way, when we talk about communicable diseases or non-direct contact, you could also pick up respiratory droplets from someone talking or coughing or sneezing by being in close proximity. Okay? Also, um, there's vertical transmission. And this is one of the ones I want to mention really quickly for people who go into OBGYN. In vertical transmission, it's usually from parent to baby or from parent to offspring. Very often from the mother because the mother harbors the baby. If we say that it's a prenatal transmission, that means before the baby was born. So this is during pregnancy. A pathogen crosses the placenta. It makes the baby sick in the womb. If we say that there is what we call perinatal, so pre or perinatal. Perinatal transmission simply means it occurs during birth or during passage through the birth canal. So if a, a female has certain STDs like chlamydia, it can be transmitted to the baby during the birth process. So, so different types of human transmission would be direct, direct human contact. There's indirect human contact, spreading through objects or droplets. And then there's vertical transmission. Prenatal, during the pregnancy, pathogen crosses the placenta. Or perinatal occurs during the birth process as the baby passes through the birth canal. Okay. Um, all right, so I want to stop with that. There's, there's so much more that we could go on and on and on about. And these chapters literally can go on forever, and I'm, I'm really trying to 
find where to trim so we have just enough, but we can build later. Finally, the last thing I want to talk about is the stages of a disease. So when a person starts to experience a disease, an illness, there are several stages of the disease. Now, give me a second while I take a drink. <clears throat> oh. So, and really what I should say is not just a disease, but the stages of an infectious disease, because we're talking about infectious diseases. So what are the phases of, a, of an infectious disease? Well, the first stage is called the incubation phase. Okay, and I'm gonna capitalize this. During the incubation phase, this is the period between acquiring the pathogen or infection and the onset of signs and or symptoms. We've talked about the difference between signs and symptoms. As you know, symptoms are um, subjective uh, expression of the disease as experienced by the patient. They're described by the patient and how they feel about it, but they're not measurable. Signs would be measurable um, objective expression of the disease that would be measured by someone other than the patient, usually, although you can take your own blood pressure, check your own fever. Nonetheless, so the incubation period is the period between when a person becomes infected or acquires the pathogen and the onset of the signs or symptoms. So you haven't felt it yet, you don't know you have it. For example, some viruses you can carry around for 48 hours before you start to feel, the, feel sick, okay? The second period is called the prodromal phase. Prodromal really means forerunner. So this is before you get sick or you just begin to feel the signs and symptoms. So this is the early onset of signs or symptoms. And there's sort of a mild expression or experience of the signs and the symptoms okay so this is when you're starting to feel like man I feel like something's coming on but you're not really sick yet you know you might be getting ill like man I'm starting to feel not well I hope I'm not getting something that would be the prodromal phase the early onset of mild signs and symptoms um, and then there's the invasive phase or the invasive period I may not write phase or period on every one of these, but the invasive phase is when you have full-blown signs and symptoms. That are typical of that disease. Okay. This is when you feel really sick. You know I've got it. So um, you might pick up a virus. You might not feel super, super hot. Might start feeling some general malaise, like you don't feel very good. And all of a sudden, boom, you have fever, you have cough, you have swollen tonsils or whatever that you're, whatever the signs or symptoms that are typical of that disease. That's the invasive phase where it's really taken hold and you are now sick. Um, several terms that I want to, three terms I want to associate with the invasive phase. The acne phase is the peak uh, experience or expression of signs and symptoms. This is when you really have it, like your fever is peaked or the coughing is at its worst. We call that the acne phase or the acne period of the invasive phase when you really have the full-blown disease, okay? If we describe something as being fulminating, that means that there is a rapid and severe onset 
of the disease symptoms, okay? That means you get it and boom, it's like zero to 90. You get really sick really, really, really quickly. That's called a fulminating disease or fulminating period of the uh, invasive phase. And then finally, um, there is what we call persistent or chronic, okay? Now I'm gonna erase some of this because I'm running out of room at the bottom of the board, but the last term that I wanna associate with the invasive phase, I should write it down here, but I'm running out of room, is if we describe something as being persistent or chronic. So when we talk about being persistent or chronic, we say that you have a continuous or prolonged period of signs and symptoms. And the opposite of chronic would be acute. Some things are acute. You get sick and it goes. Like a 48 hour virus uh, or 24 hour stomach bug, you get sick and it passes. That would be acute. Chronic would be something that sticks around for sometimes a week or two weeks. And sometimes you have a chronic cough after some kind of infection. So those would, be, those would be chronic or persistent signs and symptoms. Okay. Now, after the uh, invasive phase, we start to move into what's called the decline phase. Okay. And this is when there are uh, signs and symptoms begin to fade, okay? Or another way to say it is they begin to subside. So when someone is in the decline phase, this is when you start to feel better, okay? You're not 100%, you know, sometimes when you've been ill and you're like, man, okay, I've been laying around for days feeling horrible. Now I feel well enough to get up and move around the house, maybe make myself something to eat a little bit, watch a little TV before you go back and lay down. That's when that's called the decline phase. And you're starting to feel better. The signs and symptoms are fading. And then the last of the phases of a disease is called the convalescence phase. To convalesce means to heal. So during the convalescence phase, this is when the body and tissues repair and heal, okay? This is when you start to regain your energy and you start to feel good again and you're ready to get back to normal, okay? So those are the five phases of the disease state. We have the incubation period where you have it, but you don't know you have it. Um, you have the prodromal phase where you think you have something, like, man, I'm starting to feel ill. It's the forerunner phase where you just have the uh, beginning expression of mild symptoms and signs of the disease, like, man, I don't feel good, I'm starting to feel, eh. The invasive phase is when you have full-blown infection, like you know you're sick, um, and the, you start to express the typical signs and symptoms associated with that disease. And during the invasive phase, you reach the acme, or the, the, the peak of the illness. Um, if it's fulminating, it's a very rapid onset disease, and then if we talk about something being persistent or chronic, that means it persists or lasts a while. Then we get to the decline phase. The decline phase is when we start to feel better. The signs and symptoms begin to subside or fade. Your fever starts coming down or breaks. You start feeling better. And then in the convalescent phase is when we completely heal. You lay around an extra day or two to make sure your body is 100% and it repairs any of the damage or heals the damage. Okay. So, um, this is gonna wrap up the chapter that we're doing now. I hope some of this made sense to you. Um, I know some of this terminology starts to bleed from one to the other. For example, um, how a disease is transmitted and uh, uh, the terms between a reservoir and a vector are a little bit, and, and whether the human and animal reservoirs, when something is you know, contagious or non-contagious and communicable or non-communicable, so you need to look up those technical definitions that we wrote down and memorize them that way. And some of them are a little fuzzy and seem to, to overlap. You just gotta try to keep them straight in your head. Anyway, 
I hope you learned something. Um, I hope that you had as much fun as I did, and I hope to see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.